All right. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome to this session, which is the first session at the New York Encounter of the Awakening the Soul series. And the title is A Problem to be Solved or a Mystery to be Lived. The subtitle, A Conversation on Death, Suffering, and Euthanasia. It doesn't sound very cheerful, but please stay, okay? <laughs> and, and, and because, in fact, it's really a conversation on the beauty and dignity of life, okay? Recently, the president of the Fraternity of Communion Liberation, Davide Prosperi, wrote an article in an Italian daily on the uh, day for life in Italy, stating that this day for life is too often reduced to a clash mm -hmm. between a minority that defends the value of life and a majority that is on the whole either indifferent, but also can be adamant politically legally, and through social media regarding such issues, issues as euthanasia and abortion. He notes that the two sides often end up not understanding each other and unfortunately not listening to each other. So what to do? Prosperity speaks convincingly about the need to witness to the surprising force of life, and I'll quote him, he says, to communicate the beauty we have encountered and that, despite all the toil, we discover every day, end quote. It's a beautiful invitation to all of us, and to help us in this, I am happy to have with, here today with us two friends who will help us to rediscover that beauty through the beauty that they have discovered and rediscovered in their lives and in their work. I can afford also to slack off a little bit as moderator today because I'm going to have a very, very brief uh, introduction to who they are, but they're going to speak about themselves in the uh, first question, in fact. I'm going to ask them to speak about themselves. So let me just simply briefly say that on my left I have uh, Amanda Ackman, who is an author and founder of a cultural project to promote life and prevent euthanasia with the catchy title, Dying to Meet You. Amanda also works with Canadian Physicians for Life on ethics, education, and cultural engagement. And she lives in Canada somewhere between Victoria and Ottawa, depending on where you are normally, from Calgary originally, but travels the country quite a bit. Uh, Dr. Dulce Cruz, on my right, is a geriatric and palliative care doctor in Johns Hopkins Hospital. Baltimore, Maryland, and she lives in the D.C. area. So let's go straight to the question at this point, okay? I'd like to begin then by asking each of you why you accepted to come here today, why you accepted to come here today and speak to us on death, suffering, and euthanasia, and also if you can tell us a bit yourselves, about yourselves and let us know your connection to these issues. So thank you, John, for this question, and, and thank you to the New York Encounter for having me. I just want to disclose that I, I, I'll be speaking on my own behalf. I will not be speaking for Johns Hopkins Hospital. I would like to share with you my experiences as a geriatric doctor and as a palliative care doctor, which is my main, my main job in Johns Hopkins. I, I see yeah, 10 patients for these two um, services. So to answer your question, John, I, I would like to recount something that happened to me last year, January of 2023. I went to a talk at a parish close to me, to my home, and I heard Laura, Laura Jones talking, and she's the founder of the Dignity Mandate Foundation, which is a, an organization that works on trying to oppose the, the bill to, to make physician-assisted suicide legal in Maryland. And after, in, in this talk, she, she shared with us a documentary entitled Shining the Light on Assisted Suicide. And I was struck by this video because I knew very little about the, the law that has been proposed, but I was more struck because it, I realized that it will not only affect my own patients, it will also affect me. And this law, just to give you an idea what is um, physician-assisted suicide and, 
and tell you what is euthanasia so that you, you have an idea what is the difference between the two. If this law is proposing that clinicians, and I say clinicians because not only doctors can prescribe this now, clinicians can prescribe a medication so that the patient can take this medicine and kill themselves. In other words, commit suicide. And the difference between this and euthanasia is that the, perpetrator, the person that does the killing is not the patient, but it is the clinician. So in euthanasia, the clinician is the one administering a medication intravenously uh, to kill the patient on the basis that they are suffering too much or they have a terminal illness. So now, euthanasia is not legal in the United States. It's legal in Canada and other countries. What is legal in the United States is physician-assisted suicide. And it's legal in Oregon, Washington, California, Washington, D.C., and Colorado, among other states. And it's try it, they are trying to push forward their agenda to, to have a legal hearing, uh, so not here, sorry, have a legal uh, in Maryland. And what struck me from this video is a story that really, really described one of my patients. Um, it was kind of photographed. And in this documentary, this young lady with autoimmune disease was talking about how the, her insurance told her, we are not going to cover your medications. The only thing we will cover is assisted suicide. And that was kind of, uh, I, when I saw that, I said, I don't want an insurance to tell me uh, kill yourself. I don't want an insurance to tell me um, these things. Um, and bef therefore, I was so uh, impressed by this that I decided that despite my apolitical personality, you know, I don't like politics, I decided to write um, to my d district senator uh, about m my position against this bill. And I also decided to share this with my friends in, in Maryland because the more we talk about it, the, the more we are ready. I think we, the more we will be prepared to face these situations. Thank you, thank you, Dilsa. Amanda? Thank you. Good afternoon. Preventing euthanasia and encouraging hope is what I am most passionate about in my life right now. And it might come to a surprise, it might come as a surprise to many people why I, as a relatively young person with lots of cool education and experiences, would choose to give myself to this particular task. And when I trace what led me to this mission, I think it was really an early sensitivity to death. Because my brother Brandon was born very premature, and he only lived for seven months. I was just two years old when he died, and growing up, my parents really wanted to be sure that we, as a family, would remember him. And so, each year we had cupcakes on the anniversary of his birthday on Earth and his birthday into heaven. He was the only one in those years we had two uh, cakes and birthdays for. <laughs> and growing up, I watched home video of his baptism, of a day in the life at the hospital, and of his funeral. And even as a child, I asked to watch that funeral video again and again, which might sound strange that a sister wants to watch the funeral video of her brother. But for me, it was an age-appropriate way to get to know this brother of mine, to get to know Brandon. And in a certain sense, I grew up with him. And he spurs me on and continues to affect my life very much. Because from Brandon, I learned that his life had meaning, as each of our lives do, not only because of what we can do in them, but because of what God is able to do in and through us, through the fact that we really existed. Now, another key influence in my life was definitely my grandfather. He was a Polish Jewish atheist who came to Canada, thankfully, in 1937. And throughout my high school and university years, he lived with my family. This was very formative and pivotal to me. He was always encouraging me to study the Holocaust, and so I went on a Holocaust study trip to Germany and Poland, and I faced up to the big questions of morality and mortality. And it was during that trip 
that one of the guides said that dehumanization is at the core of genocide. And I thought, if dehumanization is at the core of genocide, what does it mean to humanize humanity? How can I participate in the opposite? And even though my grandfather had lost his faith because of the Holocaust, he encapsulated for me the words that Pope Francis says about the value of grandparents in their grandchildren's lives. Pope Francis says, we the elderly can remind young ambitious people that a life without love is arid. We can say to the young who are afraid that anxiety about the future can be beaten. We can teach young people to in love with their own lives, that there is more joy in giving than in receiving. The words of grandparents have something special for grandchildren, and they know it, and I knew it. And in those years that my grandfather was in his mid-80s, was when the Canadian government started talking about legalizing euthanasia for those whose deaths are deemed reasonably foreseeable. And anyone in their 90s, it's pretty reasonably foreseeable. Of course, it's reasonably foreseeable for all of us that we will die. But this gripped me, and it concerned me because I saw this as a potential affront against my grandfather, who I love very much, and I immediately had the sense that this concerned me personally. And so uh, eventually I worked in politics trying to prevent the legislative expansion of euthanasia on the basis of disability and mental illness. And now I am all in trying to affect the culture when it comes to these issues and have conversations given what an issue it has become. In Canada, more people have died by doctors and nurses in ho homes, hospitals, and even national parks since the legalization of euthanasia in 2016, then have died of COVID during the entire pandemic to date. And Canada has become a euthanasia capital of the world. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. I don't want to get, uh, you know, for us to be get too technical uh, about this issue, but it's, it's important, I think, for all of us is to get clarify some of the terms, you know, the meaning of some of the terms, words that are used with regards to um, euthanasia, you know, well, euthanasia itself, assisted suicide, and also in, in Canada, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning, I'm John Zuki, at, from, uh, I teach at McGill University, and, and I, I'm Canadian, and uh, one of the terms we use in Canada, the term that's used in Canada, for the euthanasia program is called uh, MAID, uh, the, the Medical Assistance in Dying. I'd like, perhaps, Amanda, if you could begin by uh, talking to us about these terms, the meaning of these terms. Sure, so we've certainly seen a change in the language to try and make euthanasia more palatable to the public. And so what first might have been euthanasia became assisted suicide, became physician-assisted suicide, became medic medical assistance in dying, and now it's, as John mentioned, ubiquitously referred to in journalism, in law, in culture, as simply made. And this has certainly deadened the ethical sensitivity around what is, as Dulce mentioned, the direct intentional killing of the patient by a doctor or a nurse practitioner in Canada. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. And Dulce, do you want to add to this at all? No, no, no. Anything that's on good. the American case or anything? Okay, no, no, thank that's you. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Then I'd like to ask the question also why, you know, again, are, are people asking for euthanasia and assisted suicide? It sounds like it's a pretty basic question, but why would people, you know, ask for this? Can, can, can you help us to understand, you know, the, the attraction, the temptation of it? I don't know if you want to sure. begin, Amanda, on that. Yeah. Yeah, I want to share a story because a new friend of mine who I met just uh, a couple weeks ago told me that growing up, even before euthanasia was legalized in Canada, her mother used to often say that she would want to die by assisted suicide if she ever lost her faculties or was suffering a great deal. And this really agitated my friend. 
until she finally got up the courage to ask her mom, why do you keep talking like that? And her mom said, well, if I lose my, if I lose capacity or I'm in a great deal of pain, I might say something mean or hateful and then no one would love me. And my friend must have been very inspired in that moment because she said, but mom, you already say mean and hateful things and I still love you. <laughs> so that kind of broke down the defenses a little bit there. So that's very important though, because a request for euthanasia is not really the expression of a desire to die, but rather the expression of a disappointment. Who will love me this way? Who will make the world accessible for me and my disability? Who will provide care for me amidst my mental illness? Who will have patience for me in my vulnerability and dependency? The request for euthanasia is not an expression of a desire to die, but an expression of a disappointment and it betrays the insecurity of the question, who will love me when I am in this state? So that's something that makes demands on us and deserves to be taken very much, uh, very seriously. And I take seriously also the motivations of Canadians who are surveyed in a Health Canada annual report about euthanasia in Canada. The government surveys those asking for euthanasia what kinds, what is the nature of the suffering that leads to the request? And if you were to guess the, kind, the nature of the suffering that leads to the request, you might guess loneliness, isolation, fear of being a burden, pain, pain or the fear of pain are grouped together in a single category, um, lack of access to palliative care. All of these are on the list, but none of these are the top one. The number one kind of suffering, according to the government's own survey of those Canadians actually asking for it, is a loss of ability to participate in meaningful life activities. Loss of ability to participate in meaningful life activities. And the second one is loss of ability to participate in the daily activities of life, kind of like personal care and day-to-day uh, -day living. Can a person ever lose the capacity for meaning? Certainly many people find life to be very, life's meaning to be very precarious. And so we're gonna discuss this a little bit further as we explore this theme. I find uh, the, the, you know, you said, uh, this, talk about this disappointment, I find that kind of sobering in the sense that it, it seems as if there was a hope before and that hope was no longer possible. So one lives in disappointment and makes that request as a result. Oh, it's quite striking. Dulce, the uh, title of this, of this session is A Problem to be Solved or a Mystery to be Lived. And there's a difference between the two, you know, between suffering being a problem and suffering being a mystery. You know, I'd like to know from you if there are people or situations that you have encountered in your work that have helped you to see that difference? Certainly, I, I would like to share two stories. One of them is uh, mm. a, a patient of mine, the other one is a personal story. So I took care of a, of a, a 74-year-old African-American patient with um, prostate cancer that was already metastasized to the bone, causing a lot of pain. And he came to my palliative care clinic and the moment he entered and, and, and he heard the diagnosis at the hospital. He, he said, I want to die. I, I don't want to live. And when he said this to me in the, in the clinic appointment, I, the son interjected and said, he said that because he, is, uh, he was living alone, surrounded by negative people. But now he's living with me. And then we were able to manage his pain, control it, to the point that he was willing to accept cancer-directed treatment. And, and he did, radi radiation therapy to the spine so that the pain was less. I also noticed something very interesting. 
because as the, as, as, as the time went by, uh, I noticed that the relationship between my patient and, and his son was changing. At the beginning, it was kind of like a little bit uh, uh, distance, and then they close they were closer to each other. They were, the, there was kind of like a, a rebirth of the relationship between father and my patient, father and son. And, you know, I, I would, as time went by, my patient couldn't make it to the clinic, so I referred him to hospice care and he received home hospice at home. And eventually he died at home, assisted by, by the, 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 the services of hospice. But, Think about it this way. What will have my patient missed if he killed himself at the time of diagnosis? He will have missed his son. He will have missed the rebirth of the relationship with his son. And he will have also missed the love of his son, which is something you mentioned, Amanda. And this love of his son was the thing that um, helped him, gave him the will to live to the point that he accepted more treatment. That's why I like to tell my patients, let yourself be loved. Let yourself be loved. So as a geriatrician, I see my patients going through, struggling a lot with loss of autonomy. So when they can no longer drive, when they can no longer organize their medications, or, with, on, where, or when they can no longer balance their checkbook. I tell them, let yourself be loved. And, um, and let me tell you my personal story that illustrates this even better because uh, it's about my grandma, Mita. And she, she was a matriarch of, uh, of our family, very strong will and personality. But then uh, the last time I saw her, she was 103 year old and she was bedridden, very tiny, skinny and I was standing in one side of the bed, of her bed, and my aunt, her main caregiver, was standing on the other side of the bed. And at a certain point, I was in a very unique moment of my life, but at a certain point I asked my aunt, why is she still here? Why is she suffering so much? And then I, my aunt uh, started talking, but there, there was one thing that stayed with me. She said, but she is my mother. She is my mother. And that's when I realized, wait a minute, I'm, I'm forgetting who I have in front of me. I'm forgetting that this is my grandma. So it was a very, a, a very important lesson for me because first you are, and then the people that help you uh, the most to, recuper the, to recuperate that is the people uh, that love you, the people around you. So it's not the, you're not defined by what you can, or can do or cannot do. You are defined by, by who you are. And paradoxically, the experience of suffering uh, restores your identity. So this is what I saw in my grandma. Thank you so much for that, Dulce, because we, we often uh, can be so ideological you know, when we deal with these issues. You know, those fighting against euthanasia can be just as the ideological as those defending euthanasia. And yet, uh, Dulce, you, what you just said now, you, you know, you let yourself be loved, you know, it's, it's, it's that there's someone that loves you is important, but it's just as important that you accept, that, that one accept that love. When we were down that level, we're beyond ideology, or what you said at the beginning, you know, that this will affect me, euthanasia will affect me, that this is, that there were, this is kind of, this goes well beyond ideology. And yet, so often we want to have, you know, kind of good arguments for, or, or hopefully against euthanasia, or, but each side wants to have good arguments to fight, quote unquote, the other side. But then you have Amanda, because Amanda, you're well known for telling stories, right? You tell stories. And, and uh, what is the value of telling stories regarding suffering and death and euthanasia? What's the value? Right, so uh, to begin, I'd like to share a story and we're going to show a four-minute short film, and uh, then I will discuss further the value of, of the story, but I'd, I'd rather show than tell in the first instance. I was born in 1935. When the war broke out, we were in London. 
I would have been five years old at the time. I came to Canada from England in 1957. Came to teach at a little country school in Saskatchewan and I married a local farmer. He was a good cat and he was quite willing, as I was once I discovered after a few years that I couldn't have children possibly. He was willing to go along with adopting the children. I got seven of them. It was just lovely. I was married to him for 36 years. He used to sometimes say some peculiar things. First of all, they thought he was bipolar, and then uh, they put him on some medicine that didn't really work. He was paranoid schizophrenia, which he, which he was. So then what happened, Christine? What did you do about this? The last 10 years, well, as I look back on it as a reign of terror, I was scared stiff of him most of the time. Everything was piling in on me, and I couldn't see any way out of it. I just reached the end of my tether. And then I decided I was going to take, I had some pills that the doctor had given me. I was very much on edge and I just decided I'm going to swallow this. I'm going to get to sleep and that's the end of it. It was so wrong. I hadn't really thought about it one way or the other until after I did it. Because then right after I'd swallowed everything, then I was concerned about the kids and began to realize how wrong it was. And so I got help. The kids I adopted were just so precious and so important. They were the happiest days of my life when I'm with them. How do you know for sure that you never want euthanasia? Euthanasia is suicide. Oh, there's no other word for whether, whether you get a doctor to help you or not. It's putting an end to your own life. It just made me shudder. People don't realize how short life is and how precious it is. We've lost our respect for life. We've lost respect for our own life, that it's a gift from God. Tell me about the story of the tattoo. During the war, they, were, they printed these cards and you're supposed to carry them in your wallet. And it said, I am a Catholic. In case of accident, please call a priest. You know, later on, when I was over here, I, I was so disgusted with the thought of euthanasia and I wanted to make a, a statement, but I didn't want to do like they did in the war, put a card in my wallet because you lose your purse. So I decided I'd get a tattoo. That would be with me forever. When I went to the hospitals, the nurses would see it. And, oh, come on, they caught another nurse in. I'd think, oh, good for you, you know. And doctors walking by would give me a thumbs up because none of them wanted to be involved in helping live people to kill themselves. It just went against the whole idea of being a doctor. In light of how much you yourself have suffered, how can you see clearly the value of life? Because I know I'm here for a reason. Because God wanted me to be. He wanted me to be born, be born into this family, have this life, eventually raise these children, um, do whatever I can to follow his way and to be with him. And the older I get, the closer I am to God. Respect the life you have. It's a gift from God. Thank you. I cannot wait to share the reaction from all of you with Christine uh, when I see her next week. So I met Christine in my hometown of Calgary, Alberta, because I go around everywhere saying that I prevent euthanasia and encourage hope. And some of her friends said, well, you have got to meet Christine. And so I got connected with her, but she can't see very well. It was even a struggle for her to watch the short film on my iPad when I brought it to her. She doesn't have email and she doesn't have a computer. And I think this really brings home a beautiful quotation by John Paul II where he says that the great achievement is to see the values that others don't see and to affirm them. 
because this, in this way, we bring our values out in ourselves and in others. In this way, we bring our value out in ourselves and in others. And so that story, so much life, so much to share, waiting to be met, though, in this intergenerational encounter. And that really showed us how we needed each other. Now, a couple points about, about this. What makes it credible? I think the credibility lies in her vulnerability. And this is something for all of us to ponder with suffering as a mystery to be lived. And in this beautiful book, Cry of the Heart, Lorenzo Albacete talks about co-suffering and willingness to risk and stake our personal identity in a kind of communion with the one who suffers. And Carol Hauslander has this beautiful definition of compassion, a communion and suffering of those who love. Are we ready to take a risk and be vulnerable in sharing our suffering as the basis for communion? Because in that same Cry of the Heart book, it's discussed how the redemption of suffering consists in the drama of suffering being transformed into the drama of love. And there's this beautiful line in the Anima Christi prayer, right? In your wounds, hide me, we say. But we can imagine Jesus turning that around to you and Jesus saying, in your wounds, hide me. Let your own woundedness and brokenness and weakness be a sort of welcome mat of hospitality for God to come in. Our vulnerability and credibility go together. Wounds speak louder than words. Tears are often more effective than arguments. And part of being made in the image of God and following Jesus includes being a shelter for the wounds of others as Christine does in that short film. And where do we do that but in our very own wounds? Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> this all reminds me this, this morning uh, at the, the session on language, Professor Morrow mm -hmm. quoted, uh, put a, up on the screen, put up a little quotation from Umberto Eco that said something to the effect of what you what you cannot theorize, you narrate. We might say what you should not theorize, something so important as life, as experience of self, and you cannot theorize life. You, you narrate, you tell stories, as in fact Amanda does, and as Christine did in this beautiful video uh, that we saw. One reason that we often hear from patients, certainly this is the experience in Canada with our, with our medical assistance and dying program, Many patients say that their lives no longer have any use. You know, they are no longer able to be of use to anyone. Or even worse, that they've become a burden to those dear to them. And from a very narrow perspective, you can say, okay, you've got a point, fine. But, and, and one can easily be even tempted to believe that this is really true about that person. How do you respond to these objections, Dulce? Yeah, they... Those are very hard objections to, to respond to. I, they do have a point. I really see it. Um, the important thing for me is to not abandon them, accompany them, because uh, there are no words when you are facing these things. So in our training as, um, as a palliative care doctor, they, they, one of the things that they tell us is, is important that whoever, whatever, if the patient asks for assisted suicide, it's important that you inquire the reasons why they are asking for it. Because usually behind that ask is, is something that you can do, it's something as a palliative care doctor that you can attend to. And let me explain that a little better. So for example, you mentioned before the, um, uh, the reasons why people uh, get made or ask for a maid, 
And in Oregon, the statistics were kind of like uh, similar. The number one reason for, for people to ask for assisted suicide was loss of autonomy. And the number two was what you mentioned, the less able to engage in meaningful activities. Um, so you see, uh, I want to uh, really, really uh, talk more about this with, with someone that I met last year. So last spring, I met this, this couple. The patient uh, has Lewy body dementia. And this type of dementia was uh, impairing his ability to drive, impairing his ability to do things on his own because he could not move fast enough. And he was also having hallucinations. So at a certain point during my, uh, during my interview, he said, but why will anyone want to go through it, through this? Why will anyone want to go through this? And it was kind of like more, not a question directed to me, it was a question for, uh, it was really more like a, an expression of frustration. And I paused and I, and I because before in the conversation he mentioned God, so I asked him about his faith and he said, I am angry with God. I'm angry with God. And uh, I validated his, uh, his feelings and I, I encouraged him to, con to continue uh, asking God for an answer. And then the, his wife interjected and, and said, it's been a long time since you, ha you, you, you have talked to your rabbi. So we agree that uh, this will be a good idea that he speaks with his rabbi. And he did actually later, next visit, he recounted about this meeting that was very helpful. And it was also a, a, a moment that he decided to join the brotherhood gr group and a support group and so forth. But this, I could have not asked him anymore. I could have ignored that expression. And this illustrates very well cause suffering, which is described in, in, in the book of Albacete, but it, it illustrates cause suffering by joining, joining the asking. And most of my job is to remain in front of my patients without being scared or scandalized by their suffering. This is um, over and over again, I'm faced with this. And to remain with them, in front of them, even if they don't want to follow what I'm telling them to do, which is most of them. And also when I cannot completely relieve what they are going, uh, their suffering or their pain, for example. And, but why? Why will, am I willing to, to not be scared, to, to remain with them? Why I'm not scared? Why I'm not scandalized by other people's suffering? Because in my own experience, as a, 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 my, my own sufferings, and also my experience as a doctor, I, I have seen that walking this path, saying yes to the, to the cross, cause suffering with people by the grace of God, because not always I'm, I'm, I'm capable, right? Is more correspondent, more human than the alternative. Actually, so correspondent that I have surprised myself joyful which is really weird, but I, I just, I, I, I don't have any other way to say it but in front of them. Um, because I am joyful there because I, I know I'm asked to be there. It's a, it, I'm, I'm doing what, um, yeah. I'm joyful, I'm joyful because I'm asked to be there with them. And I learned this from also Dr. Michael Brescia. And I, I want to read a quote for all of you. Dr. Michael Brescia uh, was a doctor that um, he used to be the medical director of Calvary Hospice here in, in New York. And he said, quote, emotional suffering is helped in four ways. Be present, touch, hold, say I love you. I will repeat that. Be present, touch, hold, and say I love you. Emotional suffering does not require sympathy or empathy. It needs love. Thanks, Dusa. I asked you a question, uh, and, uh, and uh, 
about about how you you know deal with these um, uh, uh, with with this with this question you know how how uh, someone says I have no use you know and uh, and you know I, I want to die how you deal with this and I, I love the fact that you you don't deal with an idea or with a technique but you deal with your entire humanity you know how'd you say it you uh, I'm not scared or scandalized by their suffering all your, all your humanity is implicated. You raised the question of, uh, uh, of autonomy also, people wanting to, to, to uh, be uh, 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 euthanized or to be, have this assisted suicide in the name of, of autonomy. And Amanda, that's, that's an argument that comes up you know, very often. You know? and, and this autonomy, you know, f freedom, these are all values that are upheld by, by society. And we're told that autonomy is a fundamental value. One should be allowed, therefore, to choose if they wish to die. If they feel that they can't hack it any longer, then they should be able to die. They should be free to choose. Why not assisted suicide in the name of autonomy? Mm -hmm. When we scrutinize the legitimate longings of a person who might ask for euthanasia or assisted suicide, we can see that there is a good intuition that the dying person deserves not to be abandoned when suffering and dying. Hence, those who advocate for this in the name of autonomy insist that a doctor or nurse be present. And so it's not autonomous. Suicide is purely autonomous. And so why not suicide in the name of autonomy? And so there's, there's an intuition that the dying person deserves to be accompanied. But again, it betrays an insecurity. The insecurity that no one will keep vigil for me and that they don't have any patience for me. And so you schedule the vigil and everyone flies in. There's a dying with dignity video of a woman whose calendar is empty until she schedules her death date and then everyone comes to see her. And I think one of the best sort of natural accounts of why it's better to die naturally than be killed by a doctor is found in Leo Tolstoy's novella The Death of Ivan Illich. So Ivan is this character whose life is going along easily, pleasantly, and decently. But eventually he gets sick and is dying. And the narrator says, what tormented Ivan most of all was the lie. The lie among all of those surrounding him that he was not actually dying, but merely sick. And that he might get better. And this reduced the solemn act of Ivan's dying to the level of their cocktail parties and fancy dinners. And this is what euthanasia does. It reduces the solemnity of keeping vigil in all its unpredictability and in all the demands it makes on us to the level of a legal appointment or a coffee date. And people are right to be frustrated and anxious uh, will anyone stay awake with me? Even Jesus was stressed out about that in the garden and got pretty frustrated with the disciples. So if even he could get frustrated with his friends for falling asleep again and again, how legitimate it is, this cry of the heart, don't fall asleep on me, keep vigil. Thanks, thank you very much for that. Um... Amanda, this, 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 um, it, it seems to me like from what you're saying that it's, it's like a withdrawal from the drama of life. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the, um, is it, Dulce, I want to ask you about this, this question of suffering, you know, having to suffer the unbearable, you know, physically have to suffer the unbearable is often used as an excuse, not excuse, as a, as a reason for, for the, for, uh, requesting, uh, you know, uh, assisted suicide. In Canada, there's a move you know, uh, to even uh, include mental suffering. And I guess the, the, the question I have, in your experience, you know, working with, with uh, people in, 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 in palliative care, 
uh, with people facing death, is this physical suffering or mental suffering, is it usually the greatest form of suffering they face? So um, the founder of the modern hospice um, movement, Cecily Sanders, used to talk about the concept of total pain. Total pain, that's better. And so he, she, spoke, she speaks about physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, and so, uh, emo I already mentioned emotional, social suffering. So social suffering, who will, who will take care of my children or my spouse when I'm gone? Uh, emotional suffering, I'm angry, I'm sad. Physical suffering, I cannot bear this, this pain. I cannot live with this pain. And um, spiritual suffering, why God is punishing me or why me? And this is um, at the core of what we, we attend to in palliative care. And I must say that I, this is something I, I don't do on my own. Uh, we, it's a... It's an approach that you need, not only a doctor can do all that, attend to all those needs of a patient, you need a, an interprofessional team. Actually, my team is composed of, um, we have a chaplain, social workers, nurses in our team. And i give you an example. Last week, last week I, I was seeing a patient at, uh, at the hospital, 87-year-old lady, who did, did not want uh, people uh, talking to her. She just said, I just want to go home and praise Jesus. And I said, good, I have a chaplain, very great chaplain that can come and pray with you. Her answer was, lady, I've been, pray I've been praying to Jesus long before you were born. <laughs> okay. But she liked my chaplain. She did like him. And then she, my chaplain also uh, loved her very much. But... If it wasn't for, for this team, we need each other because in order to do this job, you also need the support of, of other colleagues of yours. And um, so it's important to offer uh, palliative care, especially for, to people that are asking for may euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide because I would say, why kill yourself when you can be helped live with your condition? Why choose to, to be killed when, when one can journey with you, when there is people that can uh, accompany you in this, in, in this condition you're suffering? So this, the, the human journey of suffering that is presented to you has something there for you. I will dare to say that there is even a promise in it. Um, it's like... It, Reminds me of this quote from Cesare Pavese that he says, has anyone promised us anything? Then why do we wait? Mm -hmm. And I, I see myself and even in my patients that there's always, there's always this sense of things will be better. There's, there's this hope. And, but this hope is not naive. It's not because we are a, a positive person. It's really something I learned from others. Others teach us how to live inside tragedy. So quoting uh, something that uh, Albacete says in his, in, her, in his book, he said, the redemption of suffering is communal. That's why I say you need, you need friends, you need family, you need uh, professionals too to help you, um, help you walk this journey. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Dulce. I said just before you know, that... that, that um, we, th we feel with, with euthanasia we might be able to withdraw from the drama, the drama of suffering, but does it really, does euthanasia or th sister suicide really soften such a drama as suffering and death? Isn't death uh, objectively dramatic? Whether we, uh, though we have to face up that drama, whether we choose to die naturally or not. So given that, I'd ask you, Amanda, why should a person accept to die naturally as opposed to choosing the time of one's death? I heard a beautiful testimony and a woman who was dying said that she believes that how the story ends changes the meaning of every page. And I think we all know that that's the case. The way that the story ends changes the meaning that 
all of those who are going to live with the story receive. And so it's very important to consider that your death concerns me and others, and we belong to one another in a way that cannot but affect the community. And so um, there's, of course, the importance of considering the dying person as the protagonist in his or her own death. And there's also the importance for the friends, for the bystanders, for everyone who is present at that moment. And what value is their suffering and dying uh, to, to those ones? And I think that it was uh, Father Alfred Delp, a German Jesuit, commenting in a homily denouncing Nazi uh, euthanasia, where he, he took this question up. And he basically says in his homily that the suffering, dying person, the vulnerable person, makes an appeal to our inner nobility, to our inner capacity to love, and to our sacrificial strength. Take that person out of community, and man becomes nothing but an egotistical predator who really only thinks of his own nice existence. I like to say to the Canadians to whom I speak, I'm watching how you died, so do it right, because your death sends a message to me and to my generation, and it would be a mercy for you not to ask for euthanasia and leave me wondering for the rest of my life what I did wrong and where I failed you. That's what it is to stake our personal identity and relationship. You are my friend, you are my parent, you are my brother, and I'm involved in your life. Thanks, Samantha. thank you. This next question, uh, I'm thinking about uh, where do you get the experience that we've had in, in Canada, in fact, uh, Amanda, myself, and, and many others here. In fact, and there are uh, many friends from Montreal who were involved back from 2010, the question of euthanasia with the, uh, as a law was being proposed uh, for in the province of Quebec, which is really what the, was a takeoff point in Canada for, for uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide and for what then eventually with, to the federal government became the, the medical assistance and dying program. So there was a you know, battle like, uh, uh, fought against the, 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 the uh, advance of this program, but then the law was passed, you know, the ship that ship has sailed, and and uh, and but still there are <laughs> other ships out there in the harbor. There, there's the there's a, a move to expand the, the program in Canada to uh, allow for those uh, suffering uh, mentally to choose uh, assisted suicide as well. And we can you know, be very much involved in these questions. Obviously, it's, it's clearly if, if we if it's something significant, we want to be involved in, in fighting these laws. But I have a question for, I'd like to ask, begin with you, Amanda, really about whether, what's most important for you in this whole quote-unquote battle, if it were, is, is it the, or in this war, or whatever you want to call it, is it the legal battle, or is it the cultural one? Well, both. And I'll comment specifically on the cultural task ahead of us. What, there are many different ways to think about this, and, and one that comes to mind is, how often I'm approached by people who are trying to be present to someone who is tempted to ask for euthanasia, who's thinking about it. This happens all the time, uh, even among Catholics. And uh, recently, someone contacted me from the States and, and shared that his friend was uh, considering an assisted suicide. And this man was very troubled by it. He was very close to this man. and. Um, and so my friend said to me, I'm going to go visit him, but I don't want our last interaction to be adversarial. So what do I say? People really want to respect people's freedom. They don't want to have negative interactions. They don't want to get cut out of someone's life. And so I said to him, 
tell him that explicitly. Say, I did not come here to fight with you. I came here to fight for you. Because I insist that not conceding to a person's suicidal ideation is always an act of love. Love says it's good you exist. How wonderful that you are. I am glad you're here. And anyone who is asking for euthanasia is testing. Is that so? Will anyone meet me with some resistance in my self-hatred in this precarious situation in which I find myself? So I really encourage everyone to mount resistance to suicidal ideation, which is always an act of love. Another thing that we can do culturally, if you're looking for a call to action and to be responsible, which you look like a very responsible group, <laughs> you can probably all think of someone you know, as I begin this description, who comes to mind. Someone who is a caregiver, taking care of maybe a child with a disability, a spouse with Parkinson's, someone, like, the, the situations are endless. Think of someone you know who is doing the magnanimous, self-sacrificial, heroic work of caregiving, and who in doing so is living a pretty hidden life, and affirm them. Find a way to say, I see what you're doing. I see your inner nobility and your inner sacrificial capacity to love, and I rejoice in it with you because this is good and this is true. So that's my challenge. Go affirm a caregiver, and we will together see the values that others don't see, affirm them, and bring out these values in ourselves and others. Thank you, Amanda. And Dulce? Yeah. So Amanda said both, I said neither. <laughs> the most important battle is a personal one. Um, both cultural and legal barter are expressions of, of the same battle for the person, as you were saying, Amanda, and for society to remain human. So that's why I want to encourage each of you to, you know, don't shy away from this topic. Get yourself informed, um, uh, educated about it. And second, I will say, talk about it. More than talking about I'm in favor, I'm against, talk about life why life is worth living, why it's worth going through struggles, why it's worth going through illness, why it's worth um, going through grieving. Talk about life, uh, which is um, a work that each of us need to do, need to verify, and need to uh, witness to it, similar to what you, you were saying. And uh, I, will, I would like to add, you are affirming others. I also say uh, accompany others, joining, with, um, joining their co-suffering co with them. And especially the ones that, that want, want to a donation or assisted suicide. And I want to end with a text a friend of mine um, sent me because I think it encompasses uh, what I, what I'm, what I uh, say with these things, with this encouragement. Um, this friend of mine, she is the, she's the main caregiver of her mother with uh, dementia, and she's having a lot of struggle finding a caregiver for her mother. And she was kind of overwhelmed by the negative thoughts and environment about, about her mom's disease. And then she decided to join a group called the Quadratini in Italian, which means little squares. It's from Zoom, you know, you see everybody in little squares, right? And he, um, this is a group that meets every day to listen to mass uh, by Zoom every day. So that's the first thing they do. The second thing they do is after mass, they greet each other. And the third thing they do is that they visit each other through Italy. And she see, say, said to me that in this group, she saw a lot of people going through a lot of struggles, horrible things. But she also says, says that these people are joyful. These people are hopeful. And she texted me, we need to answer to the mentality of death with life. We need to answer to the mentality of death, of death with life. Thank you for your attention. Mm, 
Amanda, uh, just talking about this call, was, was said, said that she was here to fight, I'm here to fight for you. And you talked also, uh, now Dulce, about this, this, this personal battle, right? It's neither, it's a personal battle. I love this, I love the way that in these last two answers, you, you, you both just reminded me of something that Father Yusani said at one point in his book, commenting in the religious sense, commenting a, a uh, poem by, no, sorry, not in another book, sorry, uh, commenting a poem by Ada Negri, the Italian poetess. Um, where he, he, he said that you love a flower not because it's beautiful, but because it is. You love a child, a baby, not because it's, it, it's cute, but because it is. It exists, that is. And we forget that ising so very, very often. Even in these questions here regarding suffering, uh, death, and euthanasia, that we are, and the fact that we are, there's the fact that someone is, that someone is, is a life that's worth certainly preserving because that person exists, period. Thank you.